philosophy at the University of Warwick, specializing in political philosophy, moral philosophy, and social and political epistemology. She's written extensively on political legitimacy and is interested in the question of what, if anything, justifies democracy. She's published the book on democratic legitimacy and is the author of the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on uh, political legitimacy. Peter is currently exploring how we should uh, respond to disagreements, including to political disagreements, and what the limits of reason-based just justification are for our actions. So Fabienne, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. And let me repeat what I said in the morning. Um, it's wonderful to be among so many friends. And um, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and obviously I regret we can't be there in person, but as a second best, this is pretty good. So um, thank you, Hannah, in particular for organizing. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, let me see whether that works. Um, do you see it well enough? We can see it, yes. Yeah, great. Um, let me just minimize this, excellent. Um, oh, one second, let me put it on present the view, otherwise you might get some funny notes. Um, okay, um, right. So with all this talk about post-truth politics, it's become very clear that um, when we talk, when we think about well-functioning political regimes, we can't just be talking about moral problems um, or avoiding moral problems or solving moral problems. We also have to take seriously the epistemic dimension of well-functioning political regimes. There are obviously too many examples than um, I could mention um, from QAnon to climate change deniers, anti-vaxxer, etc., to use just the most standard examples. Um, here's an example from the British context um, in the Brexit uh, debate leading up to the referendum in 2016. Uh, lots of blatantly false claims have been made to great effect, um, supporting a decision that not surprisingly turns out to be very costly for the British uh, public. Um, so I wanna focus on political debate or what I call political deliberation here and tackle some of the epistemic issues that this might raise. So when I talk about political debate or political deliberation, I have in mind this very multi-stranded, messy process, um, which includes both the most formal level, political deliberation in uh, a parliament, for example, um, but then all the way down to contributions made on Twitter um, and everything in between. So political deliberation doesn't just take place in parliament or in the political cabinet, it also takes place in uh, a whole range of government bodies, whether it's the police or a health advisory board or education um, institutions um, to the extent that they're part of the institutions of um, a country, um, if we're talking state schools. Uh, obviously, a lot of deliberation going on in political parties, but also interest groups such as animal rights groups. Um, in addition to the formal media, newspapers, TV, radio, as well as increasingly social media. Why is um, why this concern with political deliberation? Why does political deliberation matter? And why does it matter to um, um, think about well-functioning political deliberation? Well, my thought here is, is that political deliberation matters for political legitimacy. Um, so here I'm obviously referring to some of the work I've done in the past. Um, but we have to differentiate here between two ways in which well-functioning political deliberation um, is important for legitimacy reasons. Because legitimacy can be understood in two ways. Um, it can be understood descriptively, namely um, as a concern with what do the citizens accept? Um, 
well-functioning political deliberation will lead the citizens to accept the right decisions, whereas dysfunctional political deliberation might undermine their trust, um, even in good decision making. And the effects of that, we, sort of the worst effects of that, perhaps we saw on um, the 6th of January with um, this storm of the uh, capital in the US. So the way in which well-functioning deliberation connects to what people are inclined to support or what they will um, um, reject um, is important, but I'm going to bracket that. We've had quite a few talks with perhaps focused more on that aspect. Instead, I want to talk about the normative role of deliberation, that is, um, the way in which well-functioning deliberation supports the justification of political decisions. Um, so that's that normative role of political deliberation that I want to talk about um, and try to get a better understanding of. Um, so well-functioning political deliberation in this normative sense um, must be well-ordered in order to lead to legitimate political decision-making. And by well-ordered political deliberation, I mean deliberation that responds to all valid contributions adequately. And what counts as a valid contribution is a contribution that satisfies the norms of deliberation. So that's how I think about this, this structure. And so uh, in my paper, where I'm going to talk about the norms that should govern political deliberation, I want to identify the norms that might or might not play a role in determining what counts as a valid contribution to political deliberation, if we have in mind that normative role of political deliberation. A lot of work in political philosophy um, has been done on what I call participation norms of political deliberation. So they focus on who should be included. And perhaps before the sort of development of social media, access problems, um, problems of access to the public sphere were very much at the forefront of people's minds. Not everyone could write an editorial in the Times, um, for example. Um, so a lot of work has gone into clarifying participation norms, so understanding well-ordered um, deliberation in relation to the question of who should be included and understanding this functional political deliberation through the lens of exclusion. And obviously participation norms are important, but as we are seeing, um, the, um, there seems to be also an epistemic dimension to well-functioning political deliberation, right? and to use the Brexit example again, right? um, where it looks like um, 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 wrong assertions have been made, highly problematic assertions have been made, and derailing political debate in this way. In the past, perhaps, and including today, a lot of philosophers attempted to think that perhaps by solving the participation problem, we're also dealing with the epistemic problem. But it seems to me that um, that's not quite right. So we need to think about both problems. Who should we include? How should inclusion, inclusion um, be made to work? But also, uh, what should the inputs be? What can be uh, validly asserted in political deliberation? And so my focus in this paper is primarily on epistemic norms of political deliberation, because I think they are far less well understood, even though they're really important for well-functioning deliberation. So here's how I want to proceed. I want to say a little bit more first about how I understand this connection between political deliberation on the one hand and political legitimacy, just so we get clearer on that normative role of well-functioning political deliberation, as that's the backdrop of my talk. Then I want to say a little bit more about epistemic norms and participation norms in general, just to locate the sort of set of concerns that I'm going to be talking about um, here um, with perhaps greater clarity. And then I'm going to talk through a range of possible candidate norms that could um, structure um, political deliberation that we might want to think are the ones that define well-functioning political deliberation in this normative sense. First, I consider a truth norm. Um, and I'm going to reject it. I'm going to argue that political deliberation should not be subject to a truth norm. Um, instead, then, I will consider um, 
a set of alternative epistemic norms, both substantive norms, norms that um, sort of first order level norms that govern valid contributions to political deliberation, but then also consider sub, as a sort of, sorry, procedural norms, norms that define how we should respond to each other's contributions in political deliberation. At least if I have time, um, I wanna talk about that as well. Um, good, so let me see, I have a full screen here and um, that means I can't, I'm not checking the time at all, which is a little bit concerning. Um, Maybe I should just um, run the um, um, my phone, or at least keep an eye on my phone. Um, good. So um, just to repeat, um, sorry, going back to where I was, um, or expand a little bit on my comments on political deliberation and political legitimacy. Uh, what's the connection there? Um, so the background um, of my talk is what I call a justificationist conception of political legitimacy. I would go as far as to say that this is the mainstream view of political legitimacy in this normative sense. And the view is that political decisions or political decision-making processes are legitimate in with um, if, um, 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 if they lead to justified political decisions. So political legitimacy on this justificationist view, as I call it, derives from the justification of political decisions. This justification can be procedural via right? a justification for the decision-making procedure rather than the decision itself. But justification is what does the normative work. We find that conception of um, political legitimacy in thinkers of, as otherwise as diverse as John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas um, and uh, Joseph Raz, um, um, as well as many others. So our focus is on the question of what justifies political decisions. The main alternative view of legitimacy here is what I uh, want to call a consent view. So here uh, on this alternative view, political legitimacy doesn't derive from justification, but from the, an act of consent from the citizens, or at least an absence of an act of dissent. Um, so John Simmons is the one who upheld that consent view against justificationist views in their many forms. Um, but my background assumption is here without arguing the case at all is a justificationist view of political legitimacy. And on that background, I guess that background, we can then understand the role that political deliberation plays a lot better because we can describe political um, deliberation as a process in which we examine the pro tanto justifications for different political decisions. So for example, someone might claim um, that um, hospitals are being overrun and we need another lockdown for that reason. Um, so uh, this um, argument um, relating to the uh, dire situation in hospitals is a justification for another lockdown, which can then be contrasted with uh, additional justifications as well as perhaps justifications for other measures, etc. So that's my understanding of political deliberation as a process where we scrutinize um, pro tanto justifications. Uh, the aim of well functioning political deliberation is to um, towards an overall justified decision, but I should add immediately that in normal circumstances, given the sort of complex, um, 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 the complex uh, structure of political problems, typically political deliberation, even if it's well-functioning, won't converge on a single decision. That is, um, well-ordered political deliberation is necessary for legitimacy, but it's unlikely to be sufficient. There will still then be some need for some additional decision-making mechanism, um, given that we can't expect convergence. So that's the background view. And if that's the background view, the question is um, what norms should govern well-ordered political deliberation? What helps with the justification of political 
decisions. And as I mentioned in the introduction, um, certainly participation norms are extremely important. They focus on standing to contribute. Um, so they define validity of contributions in relation to uh, standing. Um, so participation norms might not be the only set of norms, therefore everything else equal, we might want to say, right? Um, what um, participation norms um, regulate is validity in relation to standing. So in a uh, democracy, uh, democratic deliberation, we need norms that govern our equal freedom to contribute. And such norms can be equal speech, uh, freedom of speech norms. There could be norms related to uh, political campaigning, etc. So all these norms are extremely important, but clearly they're not sufficient for well-functioning deliberation. Political philosophers have um, recognized that and have tried to supplement um, participation norms um, with norms of good reasoning or practical rationality or some other um, um, norms that focus on the reasoning process of participants. Um, so Habermas talks uh, uh, about a norm that um, allows the better argument to win Rawls talks about reasonableness, so contributions have to be reasonable in order to uh, count as valid contributions to political deliberation. And Jerry Gauss specified that valid contribution rests on a good amount of reasoning um, of the individual contributors. Again, norms of this kind are important. I don't want to deny that at all but they won't um, be sufficient in addressing the sort of problems that I started out with. The problem is no amount of good reasoning or reasonableness, et cetera, um, will uh, lead us in the right direction if the input is not good, right? So if we're only fed lies, the force of the better argument or reasonableness, et cetera, right, won't get us where we should be. There's a problem with the input. And that's where epistemic norms um, play a role. So here we get now to the main uh, part of my talk. So I understand epistemic norms very generally and somewhat emptily as norms that govern what can be validly asserted. So the general form I'm going to focus on is the one that's on the slide which says that everything else equal, again, allowing that there might be other norms that are also relevant. Your contribution to political deliberation involving a politically relevant proposition P as a premise is valid if, and perhaps only if, P can be validly asserted in this context. So to go back to the hospital example, right, your contribution um, to the effect that another lockdown is needed is um, valid if, the premises on which uh, this contribution rests can all be validly asserted in the context in which you're making this contribution. Um, to illustrate then the other side of the coin here, um, if your contribution does not rest on uh, premises that can be validly asserted, then you're not making a valid contribution. So um, the contribution that Trump should be president for another four years because Biden stole the election is not based on premises that can be validly asserted in a sort of US political context, given all the scrutiny that's going on. So that's not a valid contribution on this framework. Now, of course, that's still all very vague because I haven't said anything about what defines what can be validly asserted. Um, and before I um, get to that, so different candidate norms will spell out these ideas, this idea or this criterion in different ways. But before I get to that, um, let me just quickly uh, comment on the role of context here. So first we have to distinguish between what can be validly asserted in a political context versus what can be validly asserted in other contexts. And um, uh, we have to allow that um, it is possible that uh, um, um, a certain argument can be validly made in a sort of scientific, in a lab context, say, but not in a political context. So that's one important um, 
an extinction, but also within political deliberations, there will be very different contexts, right? There will be a context of a political cabinet. Um, so where uh, the contributions are made that are directly connected to political decision making. And then there will be contributions on Twitter by someone with 50 followers, uh, where there's hardly any connection um, to political decision making. So in those different contexts of political deliberation, we might want to think about different norms that apply. Uh, and I'll come back to that issue uh, later. So now let's start filling in the blank here about what, what, might, what we might mean by what can and cannot be validly asserted uh, in political deliberation in different contexts. So a first candidate norm is a truth norm. Um, so a truth norm would say that everything else equal, your contribution to political deliberation involving a politically relevant proposition P as a premise is valid if and perhaps only if P is true. And that's a truth norm. On the face of it, a truth norm might seem very attractive. All this talk about post-truth politics and suggesting that post-truth politics is a problem might uh, imply that what we really want is political deliberation that um, uh, satisfies a truth, a truth norm. There's also this uh, well-weathered slogan of speaking truth to power, which also suggests that true contributions must have a special status in political deliberation be valid um, qua being true. In spite of this appeal that a truth norm might initially have, I want to argue that it is not um, the sort of norm that we should impose on political deliberation. So um, to show what's wrong with the truth norm in a political context, let me first focus on the necessity condition. So if truth were necessary for the validity of contributions from an epistemic point of view, um, it would be way too demanding in the following sense. It would rule out too many contributions that we want to recognize as valid. Um, for example, contributions based on scientific expertise. Now, I don't in any way mean to um, discount the sort of knowledge that scientists produce However, very often, the best that scientists can do is um, present hypotheses in which they have a high credence, the hypotheses they think that might be the best description of reality they can come up with at this particular time, a point in time, etc. Um, so if truth were the norm of um, well-functioning political deliberation, these contributions will be ruled out as not valid, and that can't be right. So a truth norm will be too demanding if we understand it as a necessary condition. As a sufficient condition, uh, it's also problematic. Uh, so if we say that, well, that, as if it's true, um, then, then, then it's a valid contribution to political deliberation. That's problematic for a very different reason, not because of demandingness, but because it encourages a kind of recklessness. The issue is that whether or not a contribution is true is often not um, accessible to us. We may not be able uh, in many standard cases of political deliberation to get a grip on whether that particular contribution is true. And the, um, what we need is an account of well-functioning deliberation that is sensitive to the sort of limited epistemic resources that we have um, in political life. And so the problem with the truth norm is that in no way um, um, uh, puts pressure on us to show that we have um, factored in the limited resources that we have, that we have appropriately responded to the uncertainty that's characteristic of political deliberation. So um, my argument against the sufficiency um, dimension of a truth norm would be based on recklessness. It would encourage too much recklessness, it would just make statements in the hope that they were true and it would be difficult within deliberation to challenge them. Um, so that's the recklessness problem. So then we need to move on and um, check whether there are 
other kind of epistemic norms that could take place that, that could take the place of a truth norm uh, help us improve the epistemic dimension of political deliberation. And a first candidate here is a knowledge norm. Um, so instead of saying that the validity of contribution depends on them being true, a knowledge norm would define validity of contributions in relation to what you know about the premises um, of your contribution. So um, your contribution is valid according to the knowledge norm um, if um, it rests on premises um, that you have knowledge of. Um, and again, we can distinguish between a necessity version of this um, norm and a sufficiency version. We might consider imposing both necessity and sufficiency. What should we say about a knowledge norm? Well, I would say my argument against a truth norm also uh, uh, in the necessity formulation also applies to the knowledge norm. Um, it is a knowledge norm as a necessary condition on well-functioning political deliberation would also be excessively demanding. And um, it was um, um, Jeroen uh, van Ritter, I think is his name, um, the co-editor of a volume on political epistem epistemology with Michael Hannon, um, who pointed me to this nice quote by the now um, somewhat um, uh, compromised uh, prime minister um, of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, who's commented um, on decision-making at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak that you have to make 100% of the decisions with 50% of the knowledge. So just like the truth norm might be too demanding, the knowledge norm is too, we often do not have knowledge level justification for the claims that we might be making in political deliberation. And the demandingness problem of the truth norm is exacerbated because not only does our contribution have to be true, we also need to have a justified belief um, um, in this particular, uh, in, in the relevant premises. So it's even more demanding than the truth norm. So um, problematic for that reason. The sufficiency um, version is less problematic. So we can recognize contribution as valid um, if um, you will have knowledge of the relevant premises. Um, what's attractive about that sufficiency version, unlike the um, uh, sufficiency version of the truth norm, is that it avoids the recklessness um, problem. If you do have knowledge of relevant premises, if you know what you're talking about, the recklessness um, uh, problem that um, I discussed for um, the truth norm doesn't present itself in the same way. So, that's a positive for the knowledge norm. Um, but because of the demandingness norm, right, uh, because of the demandingness problem, we have to rule out the knowledge norm as a necessary condition on uh, well-ordered political deliberation. So we need to find weaker norms. Um, and a possible candidate weaker norm is um, a justified belief norm. So here we're no longer requiring knowledge of the relevant premises, but we're merely requiring that you are justified to believe those uh, relevant premises. Um, so um, at least as long as we work with a theory of justification that uh, distinguishes justified beliefs from true beliefs or knowledge, right? then we can see how a justified belief norm comes apart from a truth norm or a knowledge norm. And if the conditions of justification are weaker, uh, that is, you can be justified to believe something false, um, then we can see how um, th this norm might address a demandingness problem. Certainly, uh, scientific contributions would be ruled in, right? We typically would consider um, a scientific process as a process that generates justifications for the premises on which their um, a, a scientific contribution to political deliberation uh, might rest. So that's good. Um, so what do we want to say about a justified belief norm? Uh, I just commented on how it avoids the demandingness problem. Um, it also avoids the recklessness problem in the following sense. Now, 
because it allows that valid contributions might be based on premises that turn out to be false, it doesn't prevent us from making uh, wrong decisions, potentially even catastrophically wrong decisions. But because the pressure is unjustified belief, um, it invites you, um, contributors to explain why, how they came to hold those beliefs. And that I take is a good thing for well-functioning political deliberation. So in that sense, it avoids the recklessness problem because it invites justification of any contributions that are being made. So I would um, argue that a justified belief norm is the right norm for at least some contexts of political, del political deliberation, specifically context directly connected to decision making, such as cabinet, and potentially parliament. So when we're talking about those contexts of deliberation, we probably want to impose something like a justified belief norm would be my claim here. Um, for the reasons I've explained. However, if we're talking about broader context of political deliberation, then we might be concerned about a justified belief norm. Um, it might, um, we might be concerned with such a norm inviting too much censorship, um, too much um, uh, power being given to those who can decide what counts as a justified belief and what doesn't count as a justified belief. So if we talk about broader contexts of political deliberations, such as say contributions on Twitter, we probably wanna resist requiring Twitter to operate on a justified belief norm and silence all contributions that don't satisfy that norm for censorship reasons. Another good example where we can see how perhaps um, a well-intended attempt to uh, improve the quality of political deliberation may have gone too far is when the New York Times issued a political cartoon ban. So the thought was presumably that political cartoons are often not based on justified belief, they throw out something um, um, and that could lead to a deterioration of political debate. Um, but we can see how this might be uh, inviting too much censorship. So that's a problem with the justified belief norm if we're talking about the broader context of political deliberation as opposed to the decision making contexts. So we need a norm that's even weaker if that argument um, is right. And an even weaker norm would be a negative norm of political, um, a, a negative epistemic norm of political deliberation, one that focuses on just eliminating the worst kind of contributions, such as the ones that we saw with the Brexit bus earlier. Um, so, um, so as a negative norm, it focuses on contributions that are not valid and a very weak epistemic norms that we might want to consider um, for political deliberation is um, an avoiding obvious falsehood norm. So here's a proposal. We might say that a contribution is not valid if it involves premises um, that are obviously and demonstrably false. So th this negative norm, although really weak, has some advantages. So I think it would help us shield political deliberations from the worst sort of contribution on contributions, such as the ones we got um, courtesy of <laughs> Bannon and um, similar um, contributions who tried to flood the zone with shit, as Bannon put it so nicely, um, who tried to make political deliberation dysfunctional by um, inundating it with falsehoods. So an avoiding obvious falsehoods norm is a norm that, um, say, a platform like Twitter or Facebook could implement, um, there's less of a censorship worry here, and that could already protect um, political deliberation. But because it's so weak, obviously it doesn't protect us much from the recklessness worry, right? They could still be, uh, we could still be seeing a lot of contributions that are highly problematic um, uh, and that uh, might lead to irresponsible political decision-making. Um, Hannah, how am I for time? Um, I think you have roughly 10 more minutes okay, before great. the questions begin, okay. so it's fine. 
All right, fantastic. Um, so in that case, I have time to talk about procedural epistemic norms as well. So, so far I've focused on substantive epistemic norms. So norms um, that focus uh, on the first order quality of contributions we might make. By procedural epistemic norms, I understand norms that govern how we should respond to the contributions of others. And precisely because of uh, some censorship worries, um, I have quite a bit of hope for the procedural norms. So norms that govern how we should respond to each other and norms that could perhaps um, inform platform design, like Twitter or Facebook, uh, might help us internalize some of that quality control, which would be problematic um, if, uh, if exercised by a censor. Um, so here I wanna focus on two particular um, uh, procedural epistemic norms that we might want to think about and how to govern how we should respond to contributions from others and improve political deliberation in this way. So the first is what I call a responsiveness norm, or I call it now a responsiveness norm. Um, in a paper from 2012, I think, um, I called it a mutual accountability norm. Um, so that's a positive procedural norm. And then I also want to briefly discuss a negative procedural norm. And I think the two actually complement each other. We need both um, an avoiding epistemic injustice norm. Um, okay, so the first one, a positive norm, uh, procedural um, um, epistemic norms that could govern well-functioning political deliberation. Um, it says that the validity of your contribution depends on whether or not you've appropriately adjusted your original confidence in the premises that underlie your argument in response to political disagreements concerning these premises. Um, so it uh, is compatible, so this responsiveness norm is compatible with a sort of multi-stage view of political deliberation. That is, the thought is an original contribution might lose its validity if there's a reply and there's no appropriate response to the reply that's been received. That is, if there's a disagreement, this puts epistemic pressures on you as a contributor. And if you fail to respond adequately to this, con to this pressure, um, this may undermine an even initially valid contribution. So uh, uh, such a procedural norm, a responsiveness norm is attractive because it secures some level of uptake. Um, of points made by others. Um, so it, I, the, the way I see it, even though at the moment, the way I've characterized it is very uh, vague and open-ended, but it rules out absolute dogmatism, right? That there's never any pressure on you to respond um, and um, revise your beliefs um, um, in, um, when there are political disagreements. How much dogmatism might still be justified, that is whether you're still justified to hold on to your original um, beliefs will depend on context. And here I think there's a nice um, connection to the talk um, that Chris gave earlier today. Right? We might wanna think about different contexts of political deliberation and think about how much responsiveness um, do we want to impose on well-functioning deliberation, recognizing that responsiveness to poor quality inputs can overall deteriorate um, political deliberation. Um, but typically, um, um, or what we're seeing in a lot of contexts is that there's not enough uptake of valid contributions by others. And um, so the dogmatism worry um, um, arises and that um, um, worry is addressed by this responsiveness norm. But, um, I think a plausible interpretation of the responsiveness norm will not require you to fully conciliate with your opponents. So it, a, 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 a plausible interpretation of the responsiveness norm of what it requires of you in different contexts um, is compatible with remaining disagreements. Um, so I think an advantage of that responsiveness norm, especially if uh, we are not 
um, if we formulate it in relatively weak ways, it is not very demanding. I think it could inform platform design. So at the moment, uh, platforms like Twitter and Facebook are driven by a business model that encourages likes and clicks. Um, and th these likes and clicks might well um, um, uh, focus attention away from um, valid contributions and um, um, allow us to get away with not responding to um, valid contributions, um, etc. An echo chamber effect, um, and um, so uh, if platform design could incorporate a responsiveness norm somehow, right, to move away from a likes and click model in any case, um, could be an attractive way of improving um, the quality of political deliberation. If it can be uh, applied to political deliberation, if it works, uh, it will certainly help with the recklessness problems insofar as recklessness um, is often a way of indifference towards the problems that particular political decisions generate for some people. So recklessness um, might be addressed through a responsiveness norm, um, but especially if we're talking about platform design, um, there is a censorship worry that remains, right? If uh, platforms end up um, silencing some contributions or even just uh, foregrounding some contributions as opposed to others. A second um, um, procedural epistemic norms that I think um, is essential um, for well-functioning political deliberation is what I call an avoiding epistemic injustice norm. So the um, responsiveness norm said that the validity of your contribution depends on how you uh, respond to the um, contributions from others, assuming that the, uh, the contributions from others had some sort of epistemic merit. What the epistemic injustice norm says that we should be careful not to um, uh, make our judgments of epistemic merit dependent on who contributes. Um, so that's the sense in which the two norms are really important complements. Um, so as a negative norm, the way I propose it here, uh, an avoiding epistemic injustice norm would say that your contribution to pol political deliberation is not valid if your confidence in um, your premises is the result of discounting um, testimony on these premises um, from groups that you hold a prejudice against, right? So, um, um, so as a negative norm, it doesn't say what epistemic justice would look like, but it warns us against discounting the contributions of some um, on non-epistemic grounds. Um, so if we could implement a norm like this, it would safeguard political deliberation from um, arbitrary um, distortions coming from prejudice, implicit bias, etc. Um, it would secure that um, um, well-functioning political deliberation doesn't just silence some groups, as I said earlier. Um, so think, for example, of the debate on gender self-identification. There's been quite a bit of a debate affecting philosophy as well. So the thought would be that um, uh, the most marginalized group here, trans people, right, shouldn't be silenced when it comes to discussions about um, um, gender self-identification um, on non-epistemic grounds, that is, on sort of transphobic grounds. Right? So that's what the epistemic injustice norm would try to safeguard against. If it succeeds, it goes some way in addressing the recklessness problem, again, because it gives those who are most likely to suffer from certain political decisions a voice. Um, but um, I fully recognize that this is an extremely difficult norm to realize um, because of demandingness problems and censorship worries. Prejudice is notoriously difficult to address. Implicit bias by being implicit is uh, uh, very uh, hard to get to. And I think Kasim's talk this morning um, talked about some of the problems here of how to um, create, how to get to um, um, uh, prejudice and, and counter it. Um, 
what one person would consider a prejudice is another's main political platform, right? So the censorship worry looms large and we need to find ways within political deliberation um, to address um, these um, effects of prejudice and bias without um, 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 raising too many censorship worries. Okay, so that brings me to the, my, um, to the end of my talk. It's, um, it's very much an overview of possible candidate norms. As you could tell, I don't yet have a clear view on what the right package is, both the right package of participation norms and epistemic norms on the one hand, but then also the right package of epistemic norms as such. But it just means more work to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabienne. This, this was laid out with such clarity and we all enjoyed it. So I would like to open the floor for questions. I already see several hands up. So uh, Professor Kassam, the floor is yours. Hi Fabienne, Th thanks for that. I, I really love that and, and, and really, really agreed with it. I, I actually just wanted to, to clarify your, your position by discussing an actual um, concrete case, which you discussed as well, which was the um, 350 million pound claim on the battle on the Brexit bus, right? which you, you presented, I think, as a, a fairly clear cut example of uh, a contribution that violated the epistemic norms of assertion, whatever they turned out to be. Um, so, in, in the case of that um, that slogan, um, uh, the, the person responsible for the slogan um, gave an account of his thinking um, in that case, and and so the the, the person responsible was a, a political operator called Dominic Cummings. So Cummings said something like the following: He said, "Look, uh, the actual uh, figure for the UK's contribution to the EU is very difficult to work out." Um, what we know is that 350 million is about the gross contribution, um, uh, but of course the net contribution would be much lower. Um, okay, so, so what you could say about the slogan is that there's an interpretation of it on, on which it was in fact true, um, but nevertheless misleading, right? Now, the main point is that, is that, is that Cummings said in, in his discussion that the real point of the slogan was to provoke people into argument and discussion about the UK's financial contribution to the EU. Right now, so, so the thought is that, that, so here you have an assertion which on one reading is misleading, uh, was understood as misleading by its author, but was nevertheless asserted in order to provoke a discussion of what he thought was a central issue. And of course, his, his thinking was that even if people eventually agreed that the actual contribution was 175 million, not 350, 175 million students still sound like a lot of money. And this would then strengthen the argument for the Brexit side. So my, my question is this, with that example, um, uh, understood in that way, um, do you want to say that, that it is a violation um, of, a relevant epistemic norm of assertion and which 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 norm do you think it, it violates or could it be that actually in this case for all the reasons that that, that Cummings gave it is in fact a <laughs> it's a valid assertion right good okay um, that, yeah that's a really great example and I'm, <clears throat> I was going to comment on that when I was talking about the um avoiding obvious falsehoods norm um in the sense that this norm still allows that contributions are made which rest on true premises, but that are highly misleading, right? And so there is a sense in which we can interpret this contribution as being exactly of that kind, right? Um, it rests on premises that are not exact, not obviously completely false, but still highly misleading. So the um, an obvious falsehood norm or avoiding obvious falsehood norms alone is not sufficient, right, to protect political deliberation from um, recklessness. And as this example perfectly illustrates, right. Um, so 
what I haven't talked about, and which is something which I need to think more about, is whether there's a fourth set of norms that we need to also um, consider. And these are somehow norms of good faith. Sometimes people talk of sincerity, but sincerity in a political context strikes me as somewhat out of place, right? We don't really care whether people sincerely believe all the things they say, but it should be a good faith contribution in the sense that it helps um, political deliberation in, you know, on this particular matter. And we can clearly see that this is not a good faith contribution, right? So even if it doesn't violate the um, obvious falsehood norm, um, uh, in, in the sense of the particular of this particular premise which it involves it overall isn't a good faith contribution given its misleadingness or given the misleading way it's been used i would say that if we take the contribution as a whole not just this particular um premise of the contribution it was obviously false in the sense that it was always clear that a Brexit would lead to um, a, a drastic um, reduction of the economic base and as such to less money for the, for the UK government and as such to less money for the NHS. So if we don't just focus on the this one um, a little premise, but the contribution as a whole and the, the range of premises, then I think we can probably say this was an obvious falsehood. Um, and we don't even need the good faith addition here um, to, to get to the problem. Um, then just a little final point, what you said that he intended it as a contribution, right, and see what people said, that would be fine if overall political deliberation was well functioning. That's why I'm placing quite a lot of hope on those procedural norms, right, because if it was overall well functioning and we would secure appropriate responsiveness to others' contribution, then this could just be called out as, you know, misleading and unhelpful and um, false and etc. and would be done with it. But clearly that didn't happen. So um, because of the violation of other norms, these procedural norms, um, this made it even more ill-intended. He knew that, of course, that it wasn't going, that political deliberation wasn't functioning well enough to correct him. So, um, yeah, problem, problematic in this regard as well. Yeah, just a, just a quick follow-up. I mean, thinking about these sort of, you know, political insurgents like Steve Bannon, who you mentioned, and, and yes. coming. I mean, they, they, have a, they have a kind of political methodology and the methodology is the methodology of provocation. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's the real, you know, so the idea is, is, to, is to get the public to focus on what they think of as the important questions by provoking discussion or debate where that provocation can take the form of actually asserting outright falsehoods. And I, and I just wonder what you made of that as a political, yeah. as a potentially legitimate political methodology. Yeah. So I don't think we um, can rule out and should rule out all provocation, right? Provocation as such can be good or bad, right? Um, where I think um, the, the sort of contributions we got from the likes of Bannon, um, you know, in the background, obviously, and Cummings in the background, um, was that I would say their intention was to make political deliberation more dysfunctional as a way of undermining that essential role that well-functioning deliberation plays for legitimate political decision-making, um, throwing out a lot of noise, a lot of fog, et cetera, making it more difficult for people to assess what would be a justified political decision. Um, okay, so uh, I'd like to, uh call uh, Professor Brice Magia, but I'm thinking we're nearing the end and many people want to ask you questions. So I'm going to give you five extra minutes so you can answer more and more questions. Anyway, Professor Brice Magia, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fabienne. Really, all my compliments. Uh, excellent. I enjoyed a lot. Uh, not only clarity, but, you know, um, very, very important, you know, point for me. Uh, I have a question for you concerning that, because you mentioned actually that, you know, there is a different context. There is political context, but there are also other contexts. So if I understood properly, you, you would like to say that there are some more ambitious epistemic norms, for instance, for political context, but, you know, for the political context is not attainable for different reasons. You know, so we have, let us say, you know, the, the, the different 
context and the different epistemic standards for the different context. And the political context is such that actually, you know, this ambitious norm like truth norm, knowledge norm, justification is not applicable. But if it would be applicable, it would be okay, you know, but it's not applicable. So we have a new proposed procedural norm. So I'm just wondering, because it's very important, according to my opinion, your, your point, we always have some kind of tension between the truth on the one side and the political debate on the other. But now we have the, you know, a resolution, according to me, because there is no actually the tension, but no, we only have the different context and the different epistemic standards for a different context. If we can attain in political context some, you know, better, like I say, circumstances, then we, we could apply some, you know, uh, other more ambitious, you know, more knowledge or truth norms. Am I right? Or, or probably you, 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 yeah, just. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so if I um, understood you correctly, the thought was, um, so we shouldn't be thinking about politics and uh, the search for truth intention, it's just we need to be realistic about um, what norms apply in which context. And um, in the political context, um, um, sometimes we perhaps have to lessen, uh, lower our standards somewhat, given the complexity of political problems, right? Um, yes, I think that is the picture, right? It's also conceivable, right? That in the future with new technology, we can reduce the complexity of political problems, right? We, um, we are limited by our cognitive capacities. Potentially, um, this might be, you know, at least we have some uh, progress there to be made. Um, in which case um, we get better at making good political decisions. Um, so yes, so the lowering standards uh, from an epistemic point of view, um, from my uh, perspective, comes in through the limitation of our cognitive resources, right, and the messiness of political decision making. Yeah, does that sound right? Because I think it's amazing. The first time actually I heard, you know, some consistent story. Yeah, I know that you're a peer and pioneer of all this, you know, but you know, how to keep together, you know, the epistemic norms, you know, more ambitious, and then to have, you know, politics in which we not have, you know, no, the, the, there is no metaphysical truth, there is no truth, we need some, you know, alternative epistemic norms, you know, so, or something like that. But this is really, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's really, really amazing. Thank, well, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, okay, um, Miguel, we haven't heard from you in a while. <laughs> Hello, I'm back. <laughs> Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, good. Um, so yeah, I love this topic, so I have a lot of questions, but I'll keep myself to just two short ones. Um, the first one is kind of uh, following on what just asked. Um, it seems to me like you've dismissed the knowledge norm a little bit too quickly, although I hate the knowledge norm, but I guess in some cases it might be, <laughs> it might be adequate. Um, I'm thinking about cases where yes, you know, might be required, so I'm thinking made there where you, you know some froze. wrong decision uh you just froze oh. perhaps you need yeah, to go back a little hello yes oh so i was saying uh, in the cases for example in the uh, missile crisis in the 1960s right so if some kind of deliberation there was guided by wrong information and regardless of what um outcome it was whether it was reasonable whatever you know i think these people would be blameworthy for throwing nuclear um, mi missiles onto you know innocent civilians something like that so uh, again, I'm not a fan of the knowledge norm, but it seems like in some places it might be required, yeah, even if it's the most stringent forms. Um, second thing is, I was just slightly, slightly confused. Um, so when you introduced the negative norm, you put it in terms of um, if and only if, but it seems to me at least plausible that you can have in certain contexts um, a, the negative norm cooperating with the justification norm. So, you know, not only do you have to avoid doing the, the worst thing, whatever, but, you know, the decision in the end needs to be justified as well. So, you know, is it really, do we have to stick to the if, if and only if? You were a little bit tentative about the if and only if, but I would just want to see um, if that's what you kind of meant. Good. Um, so I, I think I, I missed something, perhaps that was because you cut out about the missile crisis. So what, can you say a little bit more about why you thought yeah. that, really knowledge, that knowledge would have been required? Yeah, I just think there's so much at stake there, right? So, you know, of course, when you go to the Twitter conversation with only 50 followers, right? So, yeah, I get, I, do you get, 
what I'm saying. Um, so, so stakes matter, right? And that's part of the what, you know, what's the background of why I think we might have different norms applying in different contexts. Um, so typically political crises, right, are of the sort where we don't have full knowledge, right, not necessarily just because of misinformation, just because it's complex, right, like with the pandemic, right, that the outbreak at the start, there was some sense of um, um, urgent action being needed, perhaps um, a stronger sense than we normally get in politics, but I wouldn't say that um, um, we could have restricted um, decision making to um, the um, decisions that were justified on the base of premises we had knowledge of. There's just too much uncertainty, even though there was a clear sense of, you know, you all need to, need to do X, right? You all need to lock down, right, et cetera, ban travel, all of that. But it wasn't based on knowledge, right? Um, it was based, I would say, on justified beliefs, right? Years of experience on pandemic management. And failing to see the difference here with the missile crisis, which perhaps is similar, right? That there was um, strongly justified beliefs, right, for taking particular actions, including moral beliefs, right? But not this, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to say we had knowledge of the relevant premises or all relevant premises, right? So the um, um, the fact that um, our best beliefs pick out a clear course of action need not be a case for the knowledge norm. It could be that our best beliefs uh, still satisfy a weaker norm. And my sense is that's typically the case in politics. But maybe, maybe I'm missing something here with the misunderstanding. Yeah, like or maybe it's the moral aspect. But I think also even our moral knowledge isn't of the sort that it gives us. Well, we typically don't have knowledge, right, of relevant moral premises in politics. Yeah, um, I just think there are some cases in politics where you're damned. What you, regardless of what you do, you're damned. So um, I think the Corona case is one of them, yes. right? So you know, Sweden took a bet, yes. and you know, That's everyone's right. throwing bombs at, at them yes. for doing that, right? So I guess yes. it's one of those cases. That politics just has these kind of situations, and we have yes. to deal with them. So That's the right. knowledge norm to me is exactly what we're going on there. Right, and I would say it's a justified belief norm. But right? base your decisions on the best beliefs moral as well as empirical, right? Typically, we don't have the luxury of knowledge. And we still, and that's the Rutte quote, right? You still have to make a decision. Um, yeah. Okay, but like I said, I don't want to rule out knowledge, um, the knowledge norm as a sufficiency norm, right? If you have knowledge, yeah, lucky you, right? <laughs> that should mm -hmm. play a role in your decision making, right? Um, so I'm only resisting it as a necess uh, necessary norm, given that, you know, as with the practical context in general, you always have to act, right? To not go for a decision A is also a decision, right? To stick with the status quo is also a decision. So you can't avoid acting, you can't avoid making decisions, even if the uh, epistemic circumstances are quite diffuse. Um, right. So yeah, so that's the thought. And with the uh, avoiding falsehood norm, yes, um, I suppose, you know, the way I'm thinking about it is that the avoiding falsehood norm is potentially one that we could rule out, uh, roll out broadly in political deliberation, where we could require political plat um, 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 social media platforms, right, to implement it, um, potentially. Um, but that wouldn't uh, um, be sufficient in all context of political deliberation wouldn't be sufficient for parliament and cabinet, right? Um, they would have to satisfy uh, more stringent norms, uh, both more stringent substantive norms as well as procedural norms. Okay. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more. Carlene, please go ahead. I remember the, the, the last time you didn't get the opportunity to ask a question, so it would be definitely unfair. No, that's okay. So, I'll, I'll speak to Fabian next week, so I don't want to take time <laughs> here away from other people. So I'll, okay. I'll just wait for a week. Um, okay, Michael, uh, last question. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, Fabian, I really enjoyed the, the paper and the project. Um, so it's just a question about trying to get clearer on the proposal and in, in a way what it means to say that an insertion is invalid. So are you thinking of this as like... Um, a descriptive project of what the norms are or rather what they ought to be. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess I, I sort of am curious because if you take it to be more of a prescriptive one, then it kind of undermines our ability to say that people did things wrong in the cases we're pointing to because those aren't the operative norms yet. Um, it's more like- Say that again, that it undermines what? Uh, I was just saying if it's a prescriptive project, then we can't really criticize the people now for doing what they did because we don't think the norms were in force. And so I'm curious in a way about, um, 
I guess what the what the ambition is. So if it's a descriptive project, then in saying that these norms, or sorry, in saying that these assertions are invalid, are we saying that like we, we can criticize these people on epistemic grounds or something stronger, like we can ignore them or that they're, what they're saying can't ground political decisions or legitimacy. It just seems there's like a range of options for what it means to call an assertion invalid. And part of me thinks as someone who associates a bit with Americans, like there's nothing wrong with people saying stuff and just saying, this is America. Like I can say what I want. Um, that doesn't mean you need to <laughs> listen or that this should ground political decision making. It just means that, you know, maybe you can crit criticize me on epistemic grounds. Um, so I guess I'm just curious about the force of this idea that the assertions are invalid. Great. Um, before I answer the main question, yeah. just on the last one, right? That's a, it's a nice tension, right? Between a participation norm and an epistemic norm, right? This is a free country, means I have standing, right? Like everybody else. So I can say whatever I like. Um, but um, there are clearly areas where participation norms, however valuable and important, right, come into tension with epistemic norms, where from an epistemic point of view, we'd rather have them shut up, right? Even if from a participation point of view, we want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, um, so the, um, the, this is a really good question about prescriptive, um, this, whether it's a prescriptive uh, or a descriptive uh, project. I haven't thought about this question. Um, and while you were talking, I switched back and forth. <laughs> um, so clearly my uh, view is not settled here. Um, I want to say it's a descriptive project in the sense, yes, all contributions are already criticizable, right? Um, but I also want it as a prescriptive project because I want to make prescriptions about what some, you know, say social platforms should be doing, right? Um, I want to give them guidance. So um, maybe that can be done still within a broadly descriptive project um, by saying, look, um, at the moment, uh, you're encouraging invalid contributions or you're um, allowing for the spread and multiplication of invalid contribution. That's a problem, right? Um, so perhaps this pres policy prescription is compatible with the project being descriptive with regard to the status of these norms. Does that help? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. <laughs>